Please be seated. Well, good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've gathered this morning to praise God for the day that he's given us, and most specifically to praise God for the days that he has given Drew, our now departed friend, relative, brother, grandfather, father, husband, and brother in Christ. I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, your presence bears witness to the reality that when Jesus is our Lord, we're never really alone. It feels like to me that Drew's life ended too soon. I remember that he had attended our Monday Thursday service right before Easter this year, and soon after I learned that he had cancer. And over the next three months, I watched what was a healthy man live out really the last season of his life. Into our sadness of Drew's passing, God quietly speaks, saying, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Such comforting words come from the reality that Drew's death is not the end. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And because of this truth, today is sad, but not unendingly so. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you. Who else creates with a word and then breathes forth stars greater than our sun? Who else has been present for every moment throughout time and will continue to be so? Who else is so steadfast in love and constantly abiding in truth? Only you, Lord. You are great, eternal, and steadfast. But in your greatness, you have not forgotten us nor abandoned us. Instead, you come near us and dwell with us, giving life to us all. As we gather today to mark the end of Drew's earthly life and the beginning of his eternal one, may your spirit embrace us, comforting us in our sadness, and your truth strengthen us, giving us confidence in your eternal care for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Drew Charles Corrigan, 55, passed away at home with his family on July 8, 2023. Drew was born January 28, 1968, in Glendale, California, to Donald F. and Norma F. Raskoff Corrigan. He was the youngest of three boys. In April of 2023, Drew, Drew was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer that had metastasized to his whole liver. There were no treat treatment options, so Drew and his family decided to bring him home to Thomas, Oklahoma, to live with Sherry. From April to July, he made the most of his time by going on coffee dates with his family and having little outings every day. During this time, he had many visitors, well-wishers, and prayers. He shared many memories, imparted his infinite wisdom, and left no words unsaid with his daughter Megan. The last three months of Drew's life was truly spent doing what he loved, being with family. Drew graduated high school in 1986, John F. Kennedy High School in La Palma, California. He was an enthusiastic drummer. I can see him doing that. <laughs> For his high school band, he kept the, the love of music throughout his life. After high school, Drew continued his education by receiving his associate de degree in real estate finance from Fullerton College in 1990 and a certified paralegal degree in 2000. He also earned various certificates in real estate and tax return analysis. Throughout the years, Drew never stopped pursuing education. He took various classes such as QuickBooks and Microsoft Office programs through Autry Technology Center. He always said, no matter what happens, no one can take your education away from you. Drew was married twice and divorced twice. His first marriage gave him two wonderful daughters, 
Megan and Melanie. He married his second wife, Sherry Ledesma, in 2001. They were legally divorced in 2008. He loves Sherry very much, and they never lost touch. Since 2017, Drew and Sherry had been constant cohorts, enjoying trips, music, and watching their grandchildren grow up. Drew worked in the mortgage industry for many years. Unfortunately, in 2008, he lost his job, like so many in that industry. In 2010, he decided to move from California to Oklahoma to start over and be closer to his girls. While in Oklahoma, he worked many jobs in retail, service, and restaurant industries. For the last four plus years, he worked for the Atwoods Corporation office in Enid as loss prevention. He thoroughly enjoyed doing this job as he prided himself in protecting the company's assets. And as you can imagine, he had some pretty interesting stories to tell about some of the things he encountered. Although Drew was all business, he did enjoy an occasional company gossip. <laughs> Drew was re, uh, respected and well-liked. His coworkers described him as calming, a calming presence that made them feel safe. During this same time, Drew worked as a night author, auditor for the Holiday Inn Express in Enid. Again, he enjoyed his, this job because he was able to help customers and his coworkers. His bosses and coworkers at both of these jobs were people Drew spoke about with great admiration. One of Drew's greatest accomplishments was his sobriety. In 2008, after losing his job in the mortgage industry, he fell to alcohol addiction and for a time was, was homeless. Like most men, when Drew lost his job, he lost himself. His alcoholism affected his job retention, his marriage, and his family. Even after moving to Oklahoma, he struggled for many years. Finally, in early 2017, Drew took permanent steps to attain long-term sobriety. He moved into an all-male sober living facility at Forgotten Ministries in Enid, Oklahoma, and started the o in the OASIS program. He knew that he wanted to be a good example for his first grandson, who was born in August of 2017. He also realized that his family deserved better from him, and he wanted to be the best papa, dad, and ex-spouse. He completed the OASIS program and became a mentor to other men who struggled with addiction. He enjoyed being someone not only the men in the program could re rely on, but his family as well. At the time of his passing, Drew was six plus years sober and a vital part of his family's life. Other than work, education, and sobriety, Drew enjoyed numerous pastimes. He loved cycling, music, traveling, cooking, and family. Drew enjoyed spending whatever time he could with Sherry, his daughter, son-in-law and grandchildren. His grandsons enjoyed going through the Walmart toy aisles and pointing out all the toys they needed. I can see that happening for sure. <laughs> they also enjoyed numerous Chuck E. Cheese adventures and just playing with Papa. Recently, Drew had his first granddaughter and he enjoyed holding and talking to her. All of Drew's grandchildren adored him and will greatly miss him. Drew is survived by his eldest daughter, Megan Corrigan Rutz, and husband, Jacob Rutz, grandchildren, Braxton Emmett, and his Iris Rutz of Thomas, Oklahoma, daughter, Melanie Corrigan Lovelace, and husband, Daniel Lovelace of Stillwater, Oklahoma, his oldest brother, Kevin Corrigan, and wife, Lisa Corrigan of Anaheim, California, several nieces, nephews, and cousins, and by his best friend, caretaker, Sherry Ledesma Corrigan. He, he was preceded in death by his parents, Donald F. and Norma M. Raskoff Corrigan, his middle brother, John Corrigan, his paternal grandparents, Joseph and Grace Braun Corrigan, his maternal grandparents, Charles and Anita Kosh Raskoff, his uncle, Alfred Raskoff, and wives, Colleen Raskoff and Nancy Raskoff. He's a special man, and I love him, and it's good to be able to, to honor him today.
Thank you, Megan, for putting together that slideshow for us. It gives us another, another look at who Drew will be in our minds. Great memories, especially for your children. At this time, we'd like to share some memories. And so there's a couple people who have asked for some time to do that. Um, I will just kind of read through the names and then just invite you to follow the person that precedes you. So first we'll have Sean from Atwoods, Peggy from Forgotten Ministries, Anthony from Oasis, who may be joining us via phone. He's had some car trouble. Um, Pastor Wayne, and then Megan. Come. Well, first off, uh, when I uh, met Drew for the first time, I said, like, your voice, you should be in radio. Uh, you know, Drew was nice enough to... Uh, do some voiceover training videos for Atwoods for all the new hires. Um, I had the honor of knowing Drew for four plus years. Um, as you all already know, uh, Drew uh, was is a very re reliable person. Uh, he 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 never caused drama uh, or had drama. Um, I I never heard him speak negatively of anyone. Uh, He did a very good job at work. Um, he always finished what he started. Uh, these are excellent qualities, and I admired him for that. Um, he's, a, he's a good man. He was a good man. Um, I am very happy that our paths crossed. I've got a story here for you from my assistant uh, LP manager, uh, Pamela. Uh, Drew's a great friend. Uh, when, whenever she would be having a rough day, he would impersonate uh, one of our managers and he would nail that southern accent to a T. Um, it always made her laugh. Uh, Drew would always, uh, Drew never spread gossip, but he always loved to hear it. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Drew, Drew, uh, Drew thought it was funny whenever. Um, she would be talking to him and he would walk out of the room and she would not realize it. Um, I, I think he did it on purpose. Uh, Drew, Drew shared the love for his grandchildren with me. Um, he was so excited to be getting a granddaughter. Um, Drew was kind and thoughtful. Um, he, he would stop and talk to Brianna, her daughter, uh, whenever he was at the academy uh, uh, retail store. He gave her names of a couple of taxi drivers that he uh, trusted uh, with, uh, with Brianna, and uh, he would mention to her he, uh, she she needed to uh, she needed to use his drivers. Um, he was a hard worker, dependable. Um, uh, because I, I knew him, I would uh, get a uh, get the job done, or because he was dependable because she knew he would get the job done quickly and accurately. Uh, I, never, uh, I never knew how he did uh, two full-time jobs uh, while working Forgotten Ministry. Uh, in closing, um, you know, there's no way around the pain you naturally feel when you lose someone uh, that you like or love. Uh, you can't go over it, under it, around it. You have to go through it to help you heal. Drew will be deeply missed. Hi, my name is Peggy Grisham, and I work for Forgotten Ministries. And when Sherry asked me to come up here and do this, I was like, well, she had to to message me several days because I was like thinking I just couldn't do this I just can't but the Lord kept nudging me and here I am and so I met Drew in his addiction and um, sorry. that's not what I want to talk about I'm going to talk about the Drew after he found Jesus because that's the Drew that I knew and the Drew that I loved Okay, so to me, once Drew found Jesus, he never wavered. He knew. He knew he was, the path he was on. He knew he was not going to leave that path. 
And if you could say anything about Drew, is he was the epitome of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's kind of a sing-song thing that my granddaughters do. But like, like they said, you know, Drew was the most gentle, kind, considerate, loving person that, that ever came through our ministry. You know, he would come and sit in my office, and he'd say, hey, Miss Peggy, what's going on? And, and he wanted the juice. He wanted to know what was going on in the ministry because that's how he was. But he never, never talked bad about anybody. He would come in and talk to me about different guys in the ministry and, and maybe what they were struggling with and, and how he could help them. You know, Miss Peggy, what do I say to them? Why can they not get it? You know, why can they not see that if they just leave it with Jesus, it's going to be okay? You know, and, and, and we do that as humans. We tend to forget how hard that is sometimes. But he was there to mentor them. He was there to walk beside them. He was there to help them in their struggles and, and, and try and um, help them not fall back into their sin. You know, he came to lots of outreaches. He came to holidays and to things at my home. Um, we got to spend quite a bit of time with him, but he did work a lot. So, you know, there was a lot of times we didn't see Drew. Sometimes it was like a week or two, and I wouldn't even see him because I would see him on his bike, zooming by, going to one job or another, or going to an outreach. Um, I don't know. There was just a lot of things that he always said to me, you know, Miss Peggy, why can't they understand? If they would just do it, their life would be so much better. But when he called me, When he found out about his illness, the best conversation we had was that um, the ministry helped save his life, that um, he was able to find Jesus, he was able to stay on the path, he was able to make reconnections with his family, and that he wanted to thank us for that. And I just want to thank Drew for being part of my life. I have comfort in knowing that he's up there with Jesus, and I'm going to see him again. Thank you. We've got a friend that's on the road, and we're going to try to get a hold of him. He wanted to share something, so Lord help me here to get this to work. He was on the road and his tire went flat on him and some truckers helped him and um, and his fare was bad. So and he, he loved Drew so he wanted to share something and and so I Jeff with the I think maybe share and then you can try to call him back. Maybe he's gonna respond to it. Okay, he may be we'll we'll try again, so um, it's not working. Okay. So, uh, you know, um, Mr. Drew is a special guy, and uh, I, it was really important to me, and, and Peggy said so much about him that was excellent, that was true about him. I, to really understand him, the, the trouble he had with alcohol and what that did to him, you know, unless you've been around someone that's got an addiction, it's hard to explain it. If you've lived with someone with an addiction, you can understand it. But my hair stand up, Lord, <laughs> looking about what all he went through. So, uh, and what you've gone through. Some of you, you've been hurt, you know. And so, uh, it's challenging. Um, the ministry called Forgotten Ministries. The head guy's named Jeremiah Harrion, and he came to the to Enid like 14 years ago. He's from. Um, He's from the Wacomus area, and he actually came from Skid Row, L.A. Him and his wife met, and they, they came to, to Enid and began a ministry, and they saw a lot of the things they saw on Skid Row and realized that they needed to do something, so they began Forgotten Ministries, people that are forgotten, 
you know, the homeless and the poor and, and those that just don't seem to, to make it. Sometimes the church kind of pushes them away. But the ministry is about loving those kind of people. And so he wanted to, he's in right now in Chicago at Sin Relief uh, ministering there. But he sent me a, uh, an incredible testimony that I'm going to read. This is from Jeremiah, and he wanted to pass blessings on to, you, to the whole family. He said, first, I would like to thank the family for letting me share a part of Drew's life that I think changed him for eternity. I met Drew around six plus years ago when he was a resident at our homeless shelter called the Mercy House. I was, gift, I was gifted the pleasure of getting to know Drew for the four months he stayed during our winter season. The initial challenge, like many other residents that stay at the shelter, Drew was an, a significant alcoholic. The challenge with his addiction then was that he had been drinking so long, so much, there was a high possibility that he would die soon. The four months were challenging due to addiction, anger, and his occasional bladder problems. I remember as the season was ending, Drew started to ask questions about the OASIS, our men's transitional program, which does not allow alcohol. Struggling with doubt and multiple conversations about the requirements, we decided to let him in and they sent him home, which was a mistake. <laughs> it says, so during the first day of the OASIS program, there was no surprise when Drew came in wasted. I remember standing in the hallway arguing with drunk Drew as he decided to administer an alcohol test. With no surprise, his results became positive. It was interesting, after the re results are produced, Drew hung his head low in absolute defeat and shame. I talked to one of the other leaders. We decided to give him one more chance. We told him to sleep it off and that we would talk to him in the morning and see how to proceed. One of the challenges Drew faced that was worse than his addiction to liquor was that he had a lot of religion in his life. That at that point, that he never, never gave him the power to set him free from the addictions. So when Drew came into our meeting, it was the first time that I believed that Drew was ready to listen to know how he can have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking about him saying a short prayer and dressing up and sitting on a pew on Sunday. I told Drew that Jesus wanted to come and live inside him and change everything about who he was. But Drew had a major decision to make. As the Bible would tell him, he had to count the cost and be willing to walk away from everything. Then the old Drew would have to put to death, be put to death and he would be made into something new. And the life that he would live from that point on that he would choose to lay his life down for Jesus. One of the things that I loved about him is that he didn't do anything quick. As I sat there and watched him contemplate the decision at hand, I knew that God was about to do a miracle. It would change his life forever. His decision wasn't based on emotions or feelings, but Drew knew that he was desperate for a God that loved him, that would save him, forgive him, redeem him, and use him for some new purpose. So Drew got on his knees and cried out to the Lord to forgive him for the things that he had done. He completely surrendered his life to Jesus, and everything about him at that moment changed forever. I would say that if you are sitting here today in some way, You'd see, you've seen the change in him. You saw the change. And I can promise you that it wasn't the oasis that changed him, but it was because Drew had a relationship with the living God. If I had to guess, there are probably people in this audience that have been born by religion and have never experienced true freedom in what the Bible calls being born again. I knew that Drew would want me to challenge you with ex examining yourself to see if Jesus lives in you, because you're, you are the only one that knows if you have been radically changed by the creator of the universe, whose name is Jesus. I got the pleasure of being around Drew for the next six plus years and watching him grow in his relationship with the Lord. 
He was heavily involved with the Oasis where he was able to pour into many other men's lives that I believe helped lead many of them to the cross. Drew will be missed, but I know when the trumpet sounds that he will have a spot at the banquet table. My piece of the story is that, you know, uh, he actually made this commitment before I got involved with the, with the program. Jeremiah called and asked if I would do Bible study. You know, if I'd come in and, and on Friday nights share with some of the guys that are in transition and be able to pray with them and minister to them. And Drew was already working for Atwoods and, and Holiday Inn at that time. And so he was living in one of the bunkhouses that was behind the ministry center uh, in a little room there. And he was there in some ways to be a light to everyone that came through, and he was. But, uh, uh, you know, that Bible study, I never, you know, he came up and, and, and to explain that the, the, there's a 100 by 100 building, and we had an upper area kind of like you have back here where we go up and do Bible studies and we called it the upper room and so I'd go in there and share with these guys and Drew started coming in with the guys even though he was working and so we became friends slowly uh, there was a man who wanted to be in the program but couldn't be there on Friday nights and so we said well let's do a Bible study at 580 is a coffee house was part of the program and so I'd go pick Drew up and some of the other guys, and we'd go on Saturday mornings to the coffee house and do Bible study. And did that for, for many years. <laughs> so, uh, and during that time, I got to hear about some of his family, you know, some of you special people that are very important to him. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, he was always on time, and he would bring guys with him, and, and so we were able to really talk a lot about God. And, and so I, and when, he, when he was at home, I don't know who came and got him, whether it was Megan and Sherry, but when he was away, you know, I missed him. But, and there was a season when he'd been gone for a long time. I wondered what happened to him. And so I sent him a text, and he didn't, he didn't answer, you know. But a few weeks later, his name come up, Drew. And then he told me a story about stage four cancer and, you know, his, his life was coming to an end and, and he asked if he could visit with me. He wanted me to be a part of this, this celebration service, you know. And so I said, I would absolutely love to, brother. You know, you're special to me and it will be an honor to do that. You know, and, I, and in, in the, the Forgotten Ministries program, there's many things that, that this ministry has done. And one of them is consider it building tiny homes. We have the, the plot of land bought. We have uh, uh, approval from the city and the idea of building these little homes. There was a lot of time invested in that. And Drew always asked about that. He wanted to know about what was going on with the tiny homes. I think and probably most likely God had, you know, God had a better plan, but he probably would have received one of those tiny homes at some point. And so I, uh, um, you know, um, um, I want to share a scripture that, that really ministers to me about his life. It comes in from um, John 14. And it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were no, not so, I would have told you that I am going to there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to, to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I know that Mr. Drew has got his own special place in heaven. God, The Lord prepared a place for him. He didn't need a little tiny home, you know, in, on the east side of Enid. Uh, he needed a, a home prepared for him in heaven. And, and so I'm, how many of you want to go visit Drew in his home someday? I, you know, I, I can't wait to, to go and see what God has provided for him. So I just thank you for the, the blessing of getting to know him. And someday we'll see him again. If Drew was here, he would tell you to make sure that you've done everything right, that you made a confession of faith, and you have Jesus in your life. So...
I'm going to try calling Anthony one more time, a good friend of ours that, that loved Drew. <clears throat> You there? Yes, sir. <laughs> you got a crowd of people looking at you, looking at me, listening to you. Well, we, this makes it easier. At least there's a prettier face to look at. <laughs> That's right. So uh, you have an opportunity to share something. Peggy shared, and and uh, the fr friend from Atwoods, and I just shared some stories about Drew. And so we're calling to kind of get your piece of the story. Well, I just kind of wrote down. Can you hear it? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, well, you're talking. I just kind of wrote down the first words that popped in my head and just thought I'd elaborate on them. But, uh, so uh, when I got to the Oasis, um, Drew was there, and he was my across-the-hall neighbor. And basically, I mean, he kind of showed me the ropes. He, he was the guy that... I can go to to ask, well, how do we normally, or how has things normally been, or even, you know, he was always kind of willing to lend his two cents on how things worked, and I respected Drew and kind of understood, you know, Drew had a bit, uh, kind of similar background to me in the fact that he, he wasn't your typical guy that was in a transitional program or a uh, rehab situation or whatever, as, as far as he had done some things in his life and, and you know, was educated and that kind of thing. And so, um, I don't know, we just clicked really well right off the bat. And uh, he was my rock. I mean, he was somebody that I could go to and just vent out whatever was going on that day and just kind of throw it out there and see what somebody else had to say. And he always had a lot of wisdom about him. Um, you know, had a lot of intelligence to him, and just, he always was calm. <laughs> I, I don't think I ever saw him really get upset or too, you know, just crazy about anything. I mean, he kind of kept an even keel, so he was kind of, I don't know, to me felt like somebody that I could go to and just kind of give me a little perspective on things and just kind of work through some stuff. And so he was, you know, one of the words I wrote was that he was very kind, you know, he was, he was tough, too, and he wasn't just, uh, you know, somebody that got walked all over, but he was able to be kind and manage, you know, still kind of keeping boundaries, and I learned a lot from him on that kind of thing. Um, he was very faithful in the small things, the things that nobody was watching, he, that nobody saw, you know, just the getting up there every day, and no matter rain, sleet, what the weather condition, I mean, he was riding his bike to work. And, uh, you know, I could always point at him and use him as an example of, you know, I'd have guys complain about this little thing or that little thing or having to walk up to the store or whatever. And I'm like, Drew rides his bike to work every single day. Every single day. And if it's bad weather, he figures out a way. And he's a grown man, and he handles it. And so I was able to use Drew as an example um, for the guys, and that was huge. I mean, that's there's no can't put a value on that. It makes it so much easier to do what I was trying to do to to have a guy like that to point to. One thing I thought of too is he not just always was an example, but he never was a stumbling block. Never, not once. And that's something to say for, I mean, being around, look, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to, we're around a lot of knuckleheads. <laughs> we had a lot of guys coming in that had a lot of issues and, you know, we're not in, in good places mentally, spiritually, in any way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to even get angry or just show bad example or be a stumbling block in that way. And he never, ever, not one time, ever, I can't think of any scenario where he was like even a bad example where it's like, yeah, but don't do that. I mean, and so, I mean, he was 
in it 24-7, or when he wasn't at work, every day, you know, around the same guys, and, you know, helping in every way he could possibly help. And so he got a lot of reps in that, not just, you know, it wasn't just like a casual, hey, we meet every week at whatever time, and I have to keep this act up. It was every day, all day, that was who Drew was. And he was a great friend. I mean, you can always talk to Drew. Um, our last time, we even really got to sit and talk. He came to me and asked me uh, if I wanted to go have lunch sometime. And we went to to uh, uh, Beats Place. Can't think of it right now here in town. And just ate and had a really good conversation. And it wasn't about anything in particular. It was just staying close, just keeping tight. And so he had that sense about him that relationships were important. And watching him, you know, re establish his relationship with his family. It was beautiful because it, it was, you know, I get to see somebody come pick him up and the frequency of that and who all it is. And, you know, just you see that relationship budding, growing back. And it was just amazing to watch him reunite with his family. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, Drew was also a fun guy. I mean, he, he seemed pretty serious a lot of times. To probably, you know, because when you have a lot of new guys coming in a lot, you kind of have to fill people out for a while, and that was kind of his home, so he kind of had to keep a little bit of a barrier up just to make sure he wasn't getting taken advantage of, I'm sure, or whatever sometimes, but he was able to keep fun and keep lighthearted about stuff, and honestly, he always had some kind of little small little joke that wasn't inappropriate or anything else, but it was always kind of just the perfect time, and he had the most unique laugh, and uh, me and my kids, it became like an endearing thing. We'd see Drew, and we'd give out the same, we, we call it the hut, basically. But anytime that something kind of tickled him or caught him off guard or whatever, he'd give out that kind of little chuckle or whatever. And, and so anyway, that will always stick out to me. Just the, just who Drew was, he was a different, different kind of person. He was not fake, and he didn't try to put on any airs. He was comfortable in his own skin, it felt like, and I really admired him, and I cannot thank him enough for the example that he he gave for me to be able to point at, and, and so I, he was a blessing in my life, he was a true blessing in my life, probably one of my, my truest, actual true friends, and like I said, he was there right across the hall, so it may have been 6.30 in the morning, and then 9 o'clock at night, and then in mopping the, the hall, he had a, even though he didn't have to, and he had been there the longest and everything else, he could have caught some kind of attitude and, you know, uh, kind of lorded over guys or whatever, but Drew, by example, he cleaned the hall. That was his deal every week. Whether or not I had guys do it or whatever, he still did that every single week while he was in the main building. But he just did it as an example without complaining. And I thought that was amazing that he just, I mean, he didn't have to do that. And then later, you know, Drew ended up having, I think, two jobs. And so I started seeing him less and, you know, but uh, still, I mean, you know, Drew could have been anywhere doing anything and he still chose to draw in and be close to his brothers and pour back into the ministry. It may not have been as much time-wise or whatever, but he was intentional about it. It wasn't something that, you know, was just kind of something he had to do every now and then or whatever. I mean, and it may have just been mostly pouring into men near the end or being there, you know, and helping. But, you know, most people, once they got kind of stable or whatever, would have said, see ya, and not true. So... I just really, I'd like to say his life was an example uh, the last, at least probably six years. And if I can give your family any kind of peace that, that Drew was exactly who, you know, he came across to me in short moments or whatever, even in the small time when nobody saw, you know, he was that guy, he was still that guy. So I want to thank you guys for giving me an opportunity honor him. 
Thank you. Just uh, have peace on your heart to know that this man was, he, he, he finished the race well, I believe. Yes, amen. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless you all, he said. Yes, have a great rest of your day. Hang on just a second. At some of the meetings. Oh, okay. <laughs> Won't you come up and share that? She needs to share that. Yeah, it, it is, and you know, she, she. I would say that he's like a watchman. You know, look at all the things that he did. He kept an eye on stuff and protected things. And so that fits with the story that you're saying. So tell them about that. I'm Diana Bland, and he's very, very special to me. I did the book work for Oasis. So every Friday night, I would go to Oasis before he had his Bible study. And the guys had to come in and give me money, or I had to ask for money from them. And I had they didn't always like to do that, but they had to pay for their room and board and stuff. But they would always tell me they would give me somebody that would help, that would watch over or be in the room with me, because there were some hotheads. <laughs> and so, but Drew got where he came every week and stood guard over me. He watched over me. And, and then if the guys weren't there, then he would tell me all about how special his family was and how much he loved them and how blessed he was that God, re, God restored his family to him. And it was such a blessing, but we had such a sweet, sweet relationship because he guarded me. He watched over me and he protected me and he, he didn't have to. Because he came and gave me rent money too, but he didn't come every week. He didn't. He always had his money, but he would come every week and watch over me and protect me while I was there. So I appreciated him so very, very much. And last week, no, it was it? No, it was like Thursday. I had to go over on the east side of town. You, we say he rode his bicycle, but it was from the east side of Enid to the west side. It was 30 miles. Anyway, it was a long way. It wasn't like five miles. But anyway, I was at the health food store, and when I left the health food store, and grief hits you in many different ways, but as I left the health food store, a, bicycle, a guy on a bicycle went by, and I had to stop for a while because it was, I mean, I thought, true, and then I thought, nope, it's not true. It's not true. So he is very, very special to us. And he is very, very, he loved you guys so dearly. I want to start out by thanking everybody for coming. And I want to thank everybody for their thoughts and their prayers and their reaching out to my dad. So you've heard a lot of stories about him, about his sobriety, which was really important to him. And you've heard about his work, which was also super important to him. He really enjoyed working, and I like to think I got my work ethic from him. Um, but I'm going to talk about him more as a dad and a papa to my kids. Um, like everybody said, he was always there, and he was. He was at every birthday party. He was at every... Christmas, he could be at every Thanksgiving, he could be there if he wasn't working. Um, he thoroughly enjoyed going to the park with the boys. It was the simple things that he really enjoyed. And he was somebody that I relied on or I grew to rely on when he wasn't that for me for a long time. And I didn't realize it, you know. 
there's a lot of truth in what everybody says and you don't realize what you have till it's gone and somebody that's always there and then they're not there and you realize, oh, I really miss that. It didn't matter <laughs> what was going on. My dad would always make sure he knew when I had doctor's appointments and he would text me and ask me how they went. My husband couldn't even remember my doctor's appointments, but my dad sure did. <laughs> and uh, he just was a really funny guy, <laughs> too. In not your traditional funny way, he was kind of a dry humor. He, uh, you had to understand him. And uh, so he just, he had jokes that he would tell us growing up. None of them were ever inappropriate, but they were definitely above our head at 10 and 12 years old. And uh, I'm super grateful for the three months that we got to spend with him. And it was oddly comforting to be able to plan his passing with him and it was helpful to help me and my mom. And I wanted to publicly thank my mom for taking care of my dad. Because there were things and there were times that I wouldn't have been able to do what he needed done as his daughter. And honestly, he didn't want me to. <laughs> um, so it was, it was amazing to have him be able to come home and be close to us, and we saw him every day. He saw the boys every day, and he sometimes couldn't be as active, so he became part of the play. He was the ramps and the, the choo-choo train of the, yeah. He became part of the play, and he, uh, he just was always there. I guess I can really say he, was, he became a really reliable person and I really appreciated that and grief does hit you in strange ways and there are things that I always did with my dad that I didn't even think about. Um, my dad always thought he was a really great um, wheeler and dealer. He really wasn't all that great. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, he thought he had some secret and so every time I would buy a new car I would take it to wherever he was if he was at work I'd stop by and um, so I came to the realization I can no longer buy a new car because I can't take it to him and have him tell me what a great car it is and what a great deal I got and he really likes it so I was sharing that with my husband and He's more, my husband's more of the funny guy, and he said something really sweet. He said, my dad will take over from here. You can take it to my dad, and he'll tell you what a great deal you got. And I was like, you're right. I can do that. And I think my dad would think that was pretty cool. Um, he loved my boys, and he loved Iris, and there was just so many things. He was just, uh, just reiterating what everybody said. He was very kind, and he was very patient, and he really cared. He did care, and he started to be somebody that I didn't have to worry about relying on, which was great. We shared a lot of things. Um, my boss got me this really awesome book, 300 Questions to Ask Your Parents Before It's Too Late. And she knew I would either use it or I would put it in a drawer somewhere and never look at it. It's a toss up. So I talked with dad and dad's one of those pretty private people and I kind of told him what I wanted to do and he said, yeah, I think that would be great. So I would come over every night, way too late, and we would talk and go through questions and things that we didn't ever talk about because, I mean, why would we, right? I'm busy, I've got three kids, I work, I've got a husband. He comes every, thir every other Thursday, he would be there and he would leave on Saturday, and like clockwork. So 
we would talk about just things that I needed him to tell me. I needed to know uh, that he, what he thought he was most proud of me for. And he told me it was every time I got a diploma or a degree. And I had no idea that education was so important to him. Because, man, by the end of my last degree, I just, you know, a C is passing and I just need to get done. And I would cry over accounting homework and it was just not good. It was not good, guys. Wasn't good. Um, so <clears throat> I had no idea that was important to him. And he was just such a character. And he would... <laughs> He would make jokes or make funnies, and then he would have to tell us it was a funny. He'd say, that was a funny, and you missed it. And I was like, Dad, if you have to tell us, it's not quite as funny. And he was like, but I thought you needed to know. He always talked highly of everyone he worked with. He talked highly of everyone, the Oasis program. And there was a lot of things we didn't talk about. And when Dad got sick, my life kind of stood still because I just, he's 55. I'm not supposed to lose my dad at 55. I'm not old enough to lose a parent yet. Um, the two weeks he was in the hospital, almost three weeks, it was really hard and it was hard on him. And we had a lot of good conversations. We talked about a lot of things. We talked about how his alcoholism affected me and my family and his marriages and he shared lots and lots and lots of things with me that we never spoke about and it was so nice because we just we just don't talk about our feelings and uh, I've learned a lot of things with my dad passing and him getting sick <clears throat> I'm going to take the trips I'm gonna take the days off from work we're gonna go to the zoo. We're gonna go to the water park because my work will always be there. And don't get me wrong, I love my job. But my dad showed me that like nothing is promised. So I told him that. And I know that his passing has affected a lot of our family. Everybody's getting their uh, colonoscopies. Everybody's going to the doctor. Everybody's getting uh, everything checked out, okay? Nobody, I, I don't want to go to any more funerals. <laughs> We're all going to live to be 105. So I can't do this much more. Um, he, his brother, Kevin, flew out, and I know he enjoyed those times with my uncle. And that was fun to see them get to chat because um, my dad and both my dad's brothers were just like each other, just like each other. If you knew my dad, you knew my Uncle Kevin because they were the same people. And if you knew my dad, you knew me because I have a lot of characteristics of him. And I couldn't tell you how many times I got told in the last three months that I look like my dad. And I would be like, well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Because he's 55 and everybody would be like, you have a 30-something year old daughter? What? He would think he was much younger and truly he was much younger. But I just wanted to thank everybody for being there and reaching out and something else that my dad taught me in this time and I'm a very reserved person. I don't, I don't speak about my feelings a lot and everything is fine. I'm not upset, I'm fine. And with everybody I've had lots of people check on me and make sure I'm okay and you know, I, I felt led to tell people that I wasn't okay. And that was big for me. <laughs> and me and my mom's relationship had really turned around. Just, and my dad got to reconnect with my sister and that was really important to him. And I just, it really, our family has really come back together and I just, I really appreciate everybody. And my dad loved everybody and he loved being a part of our family and his sobriety was a big deal to him and it was a big deal to us so 
I just miss him. I miss him a lot. I miss him in things I didn't think I would miss him in. I miss him making us dinner, even though he used every freaking pot in my house. And then he would leave the dishes for us to do. He would try different recipes that would make us feel like he was trying to kill us. Finally had to tell him, Dad, we're meat and potatoes kind of people. Just stick to the basics. I miss him in things that I just had no idea I would miss him so much. <laughs> but I miss my dad. And I will always miss him. And it's not fair that we only got six good years of sobriety from him. But in those six years, they were really great years. He was a really great person. And I know he touched a lot of lives and a lot of people. And I was really grateful for all of that. And again, those were things we didn't really talk about because he didn't openly share and we didn't openly ask. But hearing about how he mentored the men in the Oasis program and how he worked so hard and he just was a pretty fun guy. And he was fun, like Anthony said, he was fun. He liked to go do Chuck E. Cheese with the boys and he was fun. I really miss him and I'm gonna miss him and the first year will be hard and the second year will be hard and but I know he is not in pain anymore and that was a big deal for him so I just want to thank everybody and I appreciate everybody's thoughts and prayers and hugs and, and if you know me you know the hugs were hard but I gave them but thank you guys so much, and I appreciate that, and thanks, Mom, for everything you did, because I know it wasn't easy, and it was pretty thankless, and Dad was kind of not an easy patient, so I really appreciate it. Thank you, Megan, and everyone else that shared. Um, I've enjoyed getting to know Drew a little bit better through your stories and some of the pictures that we got a chance to see. I appreciate your courage and some of the things that you had to say. Um, as I kind of look at the urn and know that Drew's ashes are inside it, I'm reminded that there will be no new stories of Drew. And so for the stories that you do have of him, it will be important that you share those. I would ask that you would share the best ones. Um, for anyone who's been addicted to something, their stories will include some less than best ones. And my prayer would be that uh, God would free you of those memories. Now I want to turn our attention from stories about Drew uh, to the God who redeemed Drew, who gave him the gift of sobriety and in whose presence Drew now resides, not just today, but forever, right? As Drew lived the final season of his life, he and Sherry would read and recite the 23rd Psalm together. And Sherry said that Drew liked it because of the peaceful picture that it painted. And so today I would like to spend a little time thinking about the picture of God painted by Psalms 23 and perhaps guess at why it was so important to Drew and how it can be comforting to us today. You see, in the 23rd Psalm, we get a glimpse of who God is, right? What God desires for us, and a sense of the difference that makes, both in how we approach life and days like today. I believe that God inspired a young man by the name of David, the youngest of eight boys, always saddled with the lowly task of watching the family sheep, to use his everyday experiences as a shepherd than to describe God in this 23rd Psalm. Now I'm going to talk through the, the six verses that make up the 23rd Psalm and then recite it in its entirety uh, so that you can better grasp it. The, the Psalm opens with the declaration that the Lord is my shepherd 
And to claim such is to place oneself under the Lord's care and direction. To recognize that there is someone greater than you and to trust them with your care. To say that the Lord is your shepherd is to confess that you are sheep, okay? And that you're in need of someone to follow. The line that immediately follows describes for us what kind of a shepherd God is. With God as our shepherd, we can know contentment. So immediately after this line, the Lord is my shepherd, David says, I shall not want. And then he goes on to describe what every sheep needs, food and water. Of God, David declares, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The overall effect here is more than just a satisfied stomach. David reports that God restores his soul. He makes everything right. The, the Hebrew term for restore is this sense of returning. And I think in Drew's story we hear that, right? He once was this, and then he journeyed through alcohol addiction, and now he's this. This sense of returning, this sense that what we want has been satisfied. Brokenness has been mended. And for the sinner, salvation has come. For Drew, the return to sobriety. For us today, the availability of hope in the midst of something painful. This is who God is. God is a God who restores people. A God who loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. In Psalm 23, we get a glimpse of just how good of a shepherd God is. Now, in response to God's shepherding, David notes, he says, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In response to who God is, those who follow him seek to be changed by him. It's not just a religion that I hold. It's a relationship. We give up our ways, our demands about how life should be, and we adopt God's better ways of living. Truth is, without God, our ways lead us to frustration, to disappointment, and ultimately to death. God's ways always lead to life and life everlasting. This beautiful picture of who God is and what God wants is tempered by the reality of the temptations that we still face. The next line of Psalms 23 speaks to this. David says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David recognizes that even though God is good and he restores us, we still face hard things. We still face temptations to revert back to who we were before God came into our lives. But the note here is that David is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not his destination, right? He has no intentions of staying. His confidence is in the Lord, just as Drew's confidence remained in the Lord, even though cancer was killing his body. This confidence, that temptation can be overcome with God, is heard As David declares, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod and staff were tools of the shepherd. The staff more for guiding the sheep, trying to hook them, bring them back to safety. And the rod more for beating back any would-be predator that would seek to take the sheep's life. So far, David has painted for us a picture of a loving God who calls us to be changed and follow him to follow his ways. Having dealt with the temptations that we create for ourselves, David now addresses the threats we face from others, threats from outside of ourselves. This is the evil that others do and do to us. The pain we suffer because of the choices made by someone else. While acknowledging the evil others may want for him, David also recognizes God's care as he faces these challenges. David says, Thou preparest a table before me, an image of a banquet table. 
a picture of provision, and then sets it in the context of welcome, or he sets it in this context of in the presence of mine enemies. This banquet table is set while his enemies look on, and David is free just to simply partake. Right? He feels comfortable letting his guard down. In fact, David feels overwhelmingly blessed in spite of his enemies and in spite of the threats from the outside. The next piece that he will pay attention to is that his cup overfloweth. Right? It expresses his sense of joy that even though his circumstances are challenging, he can make it through. This is an important word for us today. In truth, I don't really like funerals per se. They are reminders that things change, that change is inevitable and often painful. It is a reminder that our bodies decay no matter how well we take care of them. On the other hand, though, funerals are an opportunity to again declare the hope that believers have when God is, in fact, their shepherd. Hope that we've heard in the stories of Drew today. The Apostle Paul writes to brothers and sisters, telling them, we want you to be quite certain about the truth concerning those who have passed away, brothers like Drew, so you won't be overwhelmed with grief like many others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who died while believing in him. The funeral today is an opportunity to be reminded that death is not the end. David concludes with this theme, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For the believer, death is not our destiny. Our future, our eternity, lies in the presence of this good shepherd God that David has just told us about. This destiny with God, David claims for himself, and today I claim it for Drew, who perhaps knows better than any of us the truth of the words found in Psalms 23. But I wonder about you. Have you experienced this truth? Is God your shepherd? Or are you still trying to do things your own way? Have you gotten to the point where you're just tired of it all and not sure where to turn? I'll keep it simple. Turn to Jesus. He's what you've been looking for. He's the answer to your problems and the hope for better days. Now, while I can't promise you an easy journey if you choose to make Jesus your shepherd just as David did, I can promise that you will never regret your decision. We're reminded that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I believe one day we'll see Drew again. Here again, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I invite you to pray with me. At the close of our prayer, um, I've asked that uh, on the screen behind me we'll have the Lord's Prayer. And uh, Drew always liked to use trespasses, and so you'll see it up there as trespasses. So at the end of the prayer, I'll invite us to, to speak these words together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for being the Good Shepherd and for all that you've done for us through Jesus Christ. By giving Jesus to live and die for us, you have revealed your gracious plan for the world and shown us that your love is, in fact, limitless. By raising 
Jesus from the dead, you have promised that those who trust in him, who believe in him, will indeed share in his resurrected life. For the assurance and hope of our faith and for those who have gone on before us and already been received into your eternal care, Lord, we, we give you thanks. Now we lift up our hearts in gratitude for the life of Drew, now gone from among us, for all your goodness to him and his family through many seasons, sometimes difficult seasons of life, and for all that he was to those who knew him and loved him, and for everything in Drew's life that reflected your goodness. We praise you that his sins are forgiven, that his suffering and pain are past, and that he is safe today in your keeping. Surround us and all that mourn today with your unending compassion. Do not let grief overwhelm us or be unending, but help us remember that you are the good shepherd and you watch over us, seeking to help us lead lives worthy of being called your sheep. So that that day when we come before you and meet you face to face, we may do so with confidence. Now we join our voices together saying the Lord's Prayer. And again, the words are available behind me on the wall. Together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, Sherry is asked for a moment to give some words. Sherry, would you like to speak from the floor? Or do you want to come up here? Thank you everyone for being here. I see so many beautiful, loved faces, both old and new. Drew started coming here and he told me that he wanted to become a member of this church. And then we found out he had cancer. But in his heart, he was a member here and everybody that is a member here, you are all so welcoming and so good and so kind to Drew and to me and to Megan and our family and our boys. So I want to thank all of you and I'm looking at all of you for the love that you showed my family. Drew was a good man. He loved his family. He loved his friends. He went through some very dark times, but he pulled himself out with God's help because he accepted Jesus in his life. And Jesus turned him around. And because of that, Drew was able to provide for his children love. But he did one other thing that they don't know about. The last two months of his life, he wrote letters to all his children. And I have them here. There's a letter for Megan. There's a letter for Melanie. There's a letter for Braxton and Emmett and Iris. What I want you guys to know is <clears throat> your dad hand wrote these letters, but his handwriting is like a doctor's. You can't really read it. So I transcribed them for you. So I have your letters here. These are every bit 
as much love as he has for you as ever. And I want to give them to you now. You read them later. But they're for you. Thank you, Sherry. Here in just a moment, we're going to dismiss. You are all welcome to join us for a meal in our fellowship hall. It's just out the main doors, down the hall, keep going until you can't go any further and then take a left. I think the smell of the food will draw you. Okay, so please, please plan to stay for lunch. Um, I've invited the family to go first and eat quickly and then you can greet them. Okay, so don't maul them as they get out of here. Some of them have not eaten yet today and they need some food, all right. I think that concludes our announcements. Congregation, if you'll stand for our closing benediction and then we will be dismissed, starting with the family. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, bring you comfort and make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be the glory now and forevermore. Amen. Family, if you will follow me out.